Thank now, you. a very special guest, a man who really knows what he's talking about when it comes to the virus, Dr. Matt McCarthy, an infectious disease specialist, is with us now. Return visit to the program. Thank and you. we appreciate that, sir. Uh, I believe you're expecting literally thousands of new cases to be revealed within the next couple of weeks. Is that accurate? A uh, shorter time period than that. Uh, I think by the middle of this week, we'll have hundreds of cases. By next week, it'll be at thousands. The thing to remember when you hear that coronavirus is in New York, is that the person who tested positive was only the 32nd test our state has done. That is a national scandal. We have been far behind for weeks. We should have been testing for a month, and we haven't. And as a result, we don't know who has this virus. And I tell you this as somebody who's boots on the ground. Yep. I was in the emergency room this morning seeing patients. I'm not somebody who's sitting here pontificating. I'm looking into the eyes of scared and vulnerable patients who want answers. I, for a living, have to tell people the truth. I can't bluff my way through this. And the truth is we don't know who has this virus. Were you talking to people with the symptoms of the virus? Because you're an infectious disease specialist. I see all kinds of patients. Do you, are you taking precautions? I do. Are I take precautions. The great part about working at the best hospital in the country is I have a really strong group of infection prevention people. Um, but the challenge here is trying to light a fire under Congress under the coronavirus task force, trying to understand where the delay is coming from. You know, we're going to see a lot of headlines today about the um, pharmaceutical industry is working on a vaccine. That's 18 months away. I'm a doctor in the busiest city in the country who can't get a rapid and reliable test for my patients. That's the most pressing issue. And I, I've been beating this drum for a while now, but we've known about this virus since December. It's March, and New York State has run 32 tests. That's a scandal bordering on a cover-up if we keep offering false reassurance. But that's because they don't have a reliable, rapid test. Every industrialized country in the world has one. We created one, and then the CDC said, oh, hold up, hold up. Uh, it's a faulty test. We're going to have something to you soon. And you're going to hear a lot this week about ramping up of testing. But as of right now, this moment, we have not ramped it up sufficiently. You mean to tell me that in Germany or Italy or China or Japan, there is a rapid results test? In Korea, they have drive-through testing, so you don't even have to go into a hospital. They'll do 10,000 tests in a day. We've done 32. That's extraordinary. This is outrageous. And so I think that the president did a wonderful thing creating a chain of command uh, for the pandemic response. But now we have a leader, and that's the vice president, uh, Mr. Pence. We have to get a sense of urgency here to get this testing done. We've got to cut through the red tape. We've got to light a fire under the people who can make decisions. Otherwise, this thing is going to continue to spread. And, and that's a big problem. Okay, I, I just want to know what's involved in getting a rapid and reliable right. test. So the type of test uh, is called RT-PCR. I'm going to assume most of your viewers are not particularly familiar with the biochemistry of it. No, but no. it's a way of amplifying DNA. So that if you stick a swab in somebody's nose and coronavirus is in there, you can quickly detect it. This is something that a lab technician at almost any lab in the country knows how to do. I used to do this when I was 19 years old. The problem is if you have a contaminated reagent, which means that something in that little experiment is impure. And we created something that didn't quite work properly where we could be convinced. And the challenge has been getting the right tests out. Now this week, we are gonna finally start testing, which means you're going to see a big ballooning of cases. But remember, when you see that we have 300 cases by Wednesday, that's, only, that's reflecting what we've known for weeks. That means there's really thousands of cases, and we've got to start thinking about mitigation strategies. What that means is acknowledging that containment has already failed, and that this is spreading in the community, and what you're going to see are more people, like my friend Ron DeSantis in Florida, declaring a state of emergency. And you've got to be prepared for that. And right now, what we're hearing from the top echelon of our leadership is not reflecting what the medical community is preparing for, which is mitigation, which is closing of schools, which is all kinds of things that the doctors are talking about, but we're not conveying that to the public. You expect that to come? Oh, oh absolutely. Absolutely. You're, you're Unquestionably absolutely convinced. We're absolutely. Convinced. Uh, it's going to vary by region tremendously. I live in Westchester. When I'm walking around up in beautiful Westchester, I'm not thinking about the coronavirus. When I'm in Times Square and I'm jumping on the six train to go to work, absolutely. So I'm not saying massive uh, closures, but in, in high density areas. Remember, uh, the population density in Manhattan is 20 times what it is in Wuhan. 
So if this thing gets out, we've got problems. So I absolutely expect to see some closures. Is there a difference between full-scale quarantine in a hospital and quarantine at home? Oh, tremendous. I, I don't think we're going to see a large-scale quarantine here, first and foremost, because I think it would be unconstitutional. I don't see any way for us to logistically do what they can do in China. Right. Uh, but, but what I do see are in certain pockets, you know, in the Pacific Northwest, we're seeing this big expansion. And we've often in the headlines focus about the number of cases, 88 cases, two deaths. We're not focusing at all on healthcare workers. There are hundreds of healthcare workers who may have to be quarantined and our hospitals won't have the providers to care for this crush of patients that may soon be coming to us. So this is a big issue. That's not something I'm offering reassurance on today. That may change. Do we have the beds available in hospitals for oh, well, absolute and complete quarantine? So if you run the numbers, it doesn't look like it. Um, you know, I, what I really liked about the press conference on Saturday is that the president stood up there and then when they got into the nuances of the science, he stepped back and he let Tony Fauci step in, the most respected infectious disease doctor in the country. And what he told us was that 20% of people who get this are gonna have a severe infection, which means ICU, which means death. And we've only got 100,000 ICU beds in the country. And I can tell you that most of the time, about three quarters of them are filled. So if we have a big crush of patients, I don't know where they're gonna go. And I can tell you the last time I was on your show, after I came off, I got a call from a senior member of the military who said, our boys are ready to mobilize. And one thing that I'd be interested in exploring is, should we be building new hospitals? Should we be expanding our capacity to care for people? Because I know that there are people in the military who are ready to spring into action. And I'm telling you, as somebody who goes into the emergency room every morning, that the testing is not there yet. It's coming soon, and that's going to provide some clarity. But above all, doctor, we've got to avoid any sense of panic. Absolutely. But when you come out with thousands of new cases, and the idea that maybe we've got to have 100,000 special beds available. The military might have to build hospitals. That encourages panic. Well, I don't want to offer, yeah, I don't want to, I, panic is not a useful response. No, nope, it's not. But what I, and I can tell you, talking to patients day in and day out for years, panic doesn't help, but being prepared for the situation does. And when I hear people stand up at a podium and say, you know, life's going to largely go on as normal. Uh, there may be a few changes here and there. That's not reflecting the kind of preparation that actual doctors and scientists are doing right now for this. I'm not panicking. I've got two young kids at home. When I go home at night, I'm not worried that I'm transmitting a deadly virus to them. I just want people to be prepared. And when sometimes I hear from politicians uh, a lack of urgency, I want to use this platform to speak directly to the vice president, who is the face of this response, and say, cut through the red tape and make the testing happen so that we can save lives. Can you force people into um, quarantine in their own homes? Can, so, can you say, yeah, so, you've got to stay there for two weeks, the no thing, matter what? The thing you learn in medicine is you've got an area of expertise, and it's not wise to go beyond that. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not going to come here and tell you that legally we can force people to stay home, but we can give medical advice. And I can tell you that in certain high density areas, you might want to. When I go down to Florida, I was in Florida two weeks ago. I wasn't thinking about coronavirus. When I get into Times Square and I'm going on the sixth train, I am thinking about it. So what I say to your viewers is think about where you are. How high density is the place that you live? Uh, if you're not going into a big city, your risk is just simply different than somebody like me who's going into the emergency room every single day to see people who are coughing and sneezing. See, I'm looking for the other side of this. If we, I'd like to reach the yeah. other side. Uh, yeah. So if <clears throat> we've got a, a reliable, fast test, and if it's mass distribution, where anybody who wants it can get this thing, then you've got this explosion of new cases. Doesn't that take you closer to the far end where you're getting over That's right. It. That won't be the end. That won't be the beginning of the end. That will be the end of the beginning when we have a rapid and reliable test. And I will come on your show and I will say things have changed. We are getting the testing and that is going to give us some clarity because once we know who has the cases, then we can make these informed decisions such as should we shut down March Madness, the basketball tournament? Mm -hmm. Well, if there's a city that's got a breakout, maybe we think about it. And if we say we've tested 200,000 people and we found three cases, then we can start moving forward. And you're going to see the markets change. You're going to see stability. We've just got to start testing lots of people. And until that point, until a doctor like me can come on here 
and say, when I press a button, I get a test, and then I get a result. Until that happens, we're going to have uncertainty. Would you just stay there for one second, please? Ashley's going to give us a report on what's been going on in Iran, and I think that may pose problems for us here, as, as you, you well know. But, Ash, what is the latest? Well, the latest we have is finally the World Health Organization has a technical team now in Iran to, to support that country's efforts. But as to this point, we really don't know what's been going on in Iran. The death rate, we have about 1,500 confirmed cases, uh, 66 deaths. That's a death rate that's way above what we've seen elsewhere, which suggests there are many more cases out there that they don't know about. Um, They've shut down schools and universities in Iran. They have 300,000 soldiers mobilizing. All of this could be too little too late because a lot of the religious sites, including the Shiite shrines, remain open. And I said this earlier, one of the you know, expressions of faith is to touch and kiss the shrines. Well, imagine that in this environment. And, it just and they that. haven't stopped that practice. Doctor, I think, now, we, neither of us know this, but I am surmising that the explosion around the world in the future may well come from its base in Iran. Uh, yeah, the first text I woke up to this morning was a, pic a picture of people licking the shrine yes. in Iran. Yes. So that con concerns me. And I'll tell you one thing, there's a big question about the case fatality rate. Yes. People quote 1-2% to coming out of China. We are doing a lot of mathematical modeling. We're not using the Chinese data. We don't find it reliable. We are using the Korean data. We think that what happened in Korea is going to be a lot more reflective of what we're going to see in the United States. And we see about a 0.2 to 0.4% death rate. 0.2 to 0.4 fatality rate from the coronavirus. That's what, right. what is it for ordinary, all the ordinary common garden flu? Well, common flu is 0.1%. So what we're saying here is that this would be like a very bad flu season. So some people say, well, that's, that's pretty reassuring. Mm -hmm. a, bad, a flu season typically kills between 25 and 69,000 people. So if we're saying double that, talking about 50,000 Americans, we go to war over far less than that. Yeah. So that's how I think about it. Older people mostly at risk? Yeah, so if you're 80 years old and over, we're seeing an incredibly high uh, rate. We also are seeing for people who have comorbid conditions. Tony Fauci said at the press conference, Obesity, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, that's a pretty big swath of the American public. Yeah. So, um, you know, some people say, why is this guy so alarmed? Why is he so fired up about this? It's because I have to talk to patients every day and tell them the truth. I can't bluff my way through this. Okay. I, I have to tell them, and that's how I feel. Can you get it, recover from it, and get it again? Well, that's what we, we're, we're starting to see these things come up. Uh, and then there's this thing called the boomerang effect, which I don't know if anyone's heard about, but it's something that we're seeing in China, which is there's a place that's cleared and we say all good, mm. and then cases start rising again, and we don't know why, but I'm keeping a very close eye on this boomerang effect, and so that's going to be something to think about in the weeks ahead. Okay, hold on for a second, Doctor. We appreciate your input here. Susan, have you got an update?